Hi, I'm Max Wright, author of The Bitcoin Revolution, Ending Tyranny for Fun and Profit. What is so revolutionary about Bitcoin? Oh my God, many things. Um, it's, for me, it's principal property uh, that is most revolutionary, most revolutionary is that it is resistant to violence. And so what that means is we know that there are some problems, systematic problems with the monetary system of the world right now. And there are many people eager to get out of it. But the challenge is when they try, for example, if they try and create a gold-backed currency, what they're met with is men, men with guns. Governments will come to their places, um, you know, they're storing gold at a vault, and they might make a, they make a website that allows people to trade ownership in that gold. And so via a website, you can pay for things using the gold in the vault. The problem is it's centralized. And so the government can send over men with guns to confiscate all that gold and take it away. And that makes it very susceptible to violence. Bitcoin's pr primary property, for my liking, is that it's resistant to violence. It's completely decentralized, and unless there was a policeman in every single bedroom or in every single house everywhere in the, in the world, then it will always live on. And that makes it resistant to violence, which means people now have a genuine alternative to where they know it will be around in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, and they can use it freely in trade. And so the Liberty Dollar is a prime example of that. Uh, there, there was the CEO of that company. That's a, a point of attack that um, governments around the world can choose to hit that. And if they go and find this person, or the vault where the gold is in, and they attack that, then they can destroy the value of the currency. But because Bitcoin is cryptogra cryptographically decentralized, that means there is no point of weakness. There is no person to attack. There is no vault to attack. Uh, it exists everywhere and nowhere all at once. Well, what they can do is they can attack um, the, the, the points where it intersects with uh, the fiat world. So they can attack exchanges, they can attack businesses, they can do things in the periphery. But what we've seen already in the, in the short um, life cycle of Bitcoin is every time the government attacks a certain area, well, what that does is it just forces entrepreneurs uh, and freedom-loving people to decentralize that issue. So, for example, um, we just saw in the last 24 hours, we've just seen the creation of a decentralized Silk Road. Now, as a little bit of background, see, Silk Road was a, a marketplace that was online. It existed in the underground web, but it was still centralized. It took authorities millions and millions and millions of dollars to track it down, find out who was creating it, and shut it down. Now, this marketplace allowed people to sell things that were illegal to governments. Now, for example, uh, Bibles are illegal in Korea. Well, over 1% of sales on Silk Road were Bibles. Uh, porn is illegal in Iran. Was a few percent percentage points of sales on Silk Road was to sell porn to Iranians. Now, a much broader one that took up a lot of the um, that gets a lot of press with regards to Silk Road is drugs. Now, regardless of what your viewpoint on drugs is, there are a lot of people who think it's quite immoral to throw somebody in jail, drag someone away from their family, and destroy families because someone has a particular piece of foliage in their pocket. And what Silk Road did was allowed people to trade this um, uh, uh, marijuana and other drugs uh, on Silk Road but it got shut down because the point of weakness was that it was centralized. But a decentralized Silk Road will be, I think, like Bitcoin, like BitTorrent, like uh, you know, Defense Distributed, like with Cody Wilson and the 3D gun, a 3D printable gun. What you'll find is that that is uh, impervious to violence. And so we're gonna see that around. It's now part of our lives. Yeah, so what we find uh, with the drug wars and you know, gang violence and killings on the street, the primary reason for all that violence associated with that is because these businesses have nowhere to go to enforce contracts. If I make a deal to buy 100 kilograms of some drug and you know, I'm going to drop off $100,000, if, if, if someone breaks that contract, I can't go to the court system and say, hey, he broke the contract, can we please reconcile this? So the only things left for that entire industry is um, you know, gun warfare and gang violence and street violence. What Silk Road provided was like an eBay environment. Um, through a totally voluntary process, people can use reputation, people can use the value of your reputation on Silk Road was so valuable that it became unprofitable to um, betray people and dishonor contracts. Well, I think, I think a lot of us would like to follow our, our, our conscience a little more often. For example, there's many people, gay marriage is a, is a really big issue right now. And a lot of people would like to follow their conscience and disregard the fact that there are some you know, organization somewhere who says that you know, two um, homosexual lovers can't uh, get married. But if they do so, they will be met with people with guns. The ministers who try to minister that wedding will be met with people with guns. They'll be fined, they'll have their property seized, they'll be going to jail. And all this, there's all this violence attacking these people. Um, and so 
the reason, and I think it would be, I think most people would find it fun to follow their conscience and do what they want to do, which is in that example of the, the, those two people getting married. So now bring that over to the Bitcoin world. I think there's a lot of people in the world who think it's immoral to borrow money against the collateral of our unborn children. You know, generations in the future are being used as collateral to take on debt now. And a lot of people find that immoral. They, don't, they want to have no part of it. But if they try and do something like a Liberty Reserve or some kind of gold-backed currency, they're met with guns. And I think it would be, as it, with Bitcoin has allowed people to have the fun of being subversive in a very moral way and say, I'm not being part of that system, I'm being part of a more honorable system. And the built-in protections of that system are such that I don't have the fear of being harassed by tyrannical governments. Where Bitcoin is going to be in five years might be a little bit more of a challenging question to answer than where is cryptocurrency going to be in five years. Bitcoin is just a particular brand. It's the first, uh, first to market implementation of a cryptocurrency. Now cryptocurrency, I think uh, anyone who gives it a, a genuine intellectual investigation will, will see that it's actually a superior form of money than anything yet conceived by man. And so we can almost certainly say that in five, ten years, cryptocurrency is going to be significantly uh, more of part of our lives than ever before. Now, with regards to Bitcoin, I think it's, it's surpassed the vast majority of its, its hurdles. It's, it's left those hurdles. And really the only hurdle it has left is if there is a superior cryptocurrency or perhaps a superior invention that comes along and makes it redundant. But uh, unless that happens, I think you'll find that Bitcoin is uh, certainly a, 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 a huge part of the economic landscape, taking up a significant amount of uh, our daily economic lives. With regards to our traditional forms of money, be it, um, let's take the example of fiat currency. So whether, whether or not this piece of paper has value depends on the government that is backing it and what its taxable uh, citizenship has available to pay the debt on that. And that's why it has value. With regards to um, a, co a company like a Liberty Reserve or eGold, the reason those things have value is that you need to know and have faith and trust that the gold is in the vault. And so it's very much in our traditional mindset, it's very important to know who is behind this currency because their reputation is significant in knowing that our funds and the true wealth is actually safe. What Bitcoin has done is it has allowed for cryptographically proven mathematical wealth to be distributed in the internet ether. And so that means you don't need to know, there's no, you don't need to have faith in who invented it, who is storing it, because you're storing it. You have complete control over your money. And therefore, you're not relying on any other party. And that's significant because what that means is Bitcoin becomes a trustless environment. Not that it doesn't have any trust, in that you don't need trust, because you can investigate, you can know the code. It's an open source code, so it doesn't matter who invented it, you can just go and see what they invented and decide if that's for you. I care as a, in the same way I care who's dating Brad Pitt at the moment, <laughs> but it's, a, it's, it's not a significantly important aspect as to whether or not I store wealth uh, in Bitcoin, who invented it. Um, but I, I do have an interest, sure. I, I mean, I think he's uh, demonstrated, Satoshi Nakamoto has demonstrated himself to be a, a genius. Uh, we're, we're five years into Bitcoin now, and just now we're seeing um, people come up with use cases and developing businesses on top of protocols that he originally put in five years ago that when it was just, a, just an idea in his head, we've now got millions of people around the world using Bitcoin, coming up with new ideas, maybe we should use Bitcoin for this, maybe we should use Bitcoin for that. And we go back and look at the original code and we see Satoshi has allowed for that, allowed that in the protocol and given us the tools to take it, to keep on taking it into the future. And that is mind blowing that a single person, or maybe it was a group of people, I don't know, had the foresight to um, do that with this revolutionary new technology. Well, the sky's the limit. So at its core, um, the invention was the blockchain technology. Bitcoin is just the first implementation of that. Now, the blockchain technology, what it allows is a decentralized ledger of fact. So in the, in the case of currency, what it allows you to do is to know that wallet A transferred five Bitcoins to wallet B. And that now gets put into this decentralized blockchain. It exists everywhere in the whole internet universe. You can go and download it, check it out, and it exists for all time. 
So what that allows, so let's, in use cases outside of currency, let's take, for example, um, lands, land titles. If I buy a piece of real estate, I have to go and register that at a government office, and that government office hopefully records that I own that piece of land. Should there be any dispute over that land, I can go and uh, you know, claim that land or whatever, and you can go to court and do those kinds of things. Now, if there was a nefarious actor inside the government and transferred that piece of land you know, to somebody else, and as we've seen in communist countries and things like that throughout history, they nationalise particular pieces of land. So you don't have full protection that those kinds of services offer protection against your fellow citizens, but not against your government. What the blockchain technology allows is that you have protection against everybody, all forms of um, people, governments, organisations. And so let's take, for example, the, the, the idea of um, uh, like a, a land office or a titles office for, on a blockchain technology. Well, those who hold the private key for a particular lot of land on the blockchain, they're the ones who own it. And as long as you can keep those private keys safe, you have it. Another great example is domain names. If I go and buy a domain name, you know, abc.com, Again, that's mine, as long as the regulatory body and you know, the, the organization that is in charge of managing the, the, the who owns what domain um, pledges that to me. But if they're nefarious actors, if, you know, if, if they want to seize it, if a government wants to take control of it, I'm now vulnerable. Again, what the blockchain allows is that whoever owns the private key, they're the ones who own that domain name, and they can point that domain name to whatever server. No governments, no organizations, no individuals can seize that. Well, the reason we can't trust the banks is because the banks are made of men. There's no and men and women. There's no such thing as a, a bank. There is a you know, there are shareholders, there are CEOs, there are managers, there are employees. And these these are people. And you know, I don't know what planet you're living on, but people are, you know, they, they do have greed. They do um, they do things that are not necessarily what they're supposed to do. That's why we have a whole justice system and a court system and whatever else. And we try to protect against that as best as possible. And there's also a lot of resources that go towards protecting against that. You have these huge regulatory bodies that taxpayers have to pay for. We have court systems. Then we pay for them to go to jail if they do something wrong. And then, you know, in the case of like, you know, like a Bernie Madoff type scenario, they steal billions of dollars of people. And then the victims who had the money stolen now have to go and pay if he went to jail, which he didn't, to, well, he had to pay for the regular, regulatory body to ignore the crime. But the, you know, on the lower levels, if you're not politically connected, you end up going to jail, and now the victims pay for the incarceration of the person. So wouldn't this, what, a, what a far superior system where there was simply no opportunity for fraud. There was simple, simply no opportunity for um, poor management. I mean, let alone the fact that we're people doing things deliberately and illegally to steal from you. What about if they just are a poor manager of the business and the business goes bankrupt and you've lost your funds that you had invested in that bank? Um, you know, 2008, we would have seen that all across the world had it not been for the bailouts. And that was a, ca a case where, well, these banks are too big to fail, so we're going to take the losses and distribute it across all taxpayers. You know, and the taxpayers are now footing the bills for billions of dollars worth of bailouts. What Bitcoin allows is that there is no need for trust. There is, you don't have to trust a person. You don't need these huge bureaucracies and engines and police force and justice systems to and wasted resources to protect against these things because they cannot happen. Correct. So Bitcoin can't fail because Bitcoin is a trustless environment. However, the companies and, and, and organizations that grow up around it are not necessarily trustless. Now they can be made to be so perhaps with a certain amount of technological advance and invention. But so Mt. Gox was one of the very first um, big players in the Bitcoin environment. It was, uh, and it didn't, it didn't participate, it, it used Bitcoin to, for, for, for once it was on its site, but once you were on its site, you were not protected by the blockchain in any way, shape or form. All those transactions were off blockchain. And so that was not a trustless environment in any way, shape or form. In that environment, you absolutely, absolutely need to know who is behind it, what are they doing, and all those kinds of things. We're seeing this now at all the conferences I go to, that there's, that there's technology being produced and the free market is solving these problems and it's just expanding the next level of decentralized protection. And so now the exchanges are going to be trustless. You won't need to know who's behind them because it will be mathematically proven in the cryptography of the whole ecosystem that those exchanges or those banks or those insurance companies in the future, not now, have the funds to back up what depositors have put on. So one of the most exciting things about Bitcoin is, is its ability to help the poorest people on the planet. So there's about four to five billion people on the planet who are unbanked. 
Now, let's take America specifically, for example. It's one of the most banked countries in the world, and 90% of its citizens have a bank account. The 10% of its citizens do not, the poorest 10%. And what that means is when the poorest 10% of America go and get a job or whatever, they get a paycheck. And they have to take that paycheck to a payday loan shark who will cash that for them. And they take about 20, 30% of their paycheck. That's the poorest people in the country. They mean 20, 20 to 30% of their wages stolen. Now remember, they've got to give half of it to the government income tax as well. They're not left with much. And so what Bitcoin allows is it allows everybody to be banked immediately with no fees, with no gatekeepers, no credit checks. Everybody has the ability to be banked. Now that cuts out a huge middleman and allows the very poorest people in the world to get their money. Now America is a very banked country, 90%. In some parts of the third world, in parts of Africa, we're talking about 70, 80, 90% of the population unbanked. This is a huge boon to these people in their ability to, to participate in economic trade. Uh, so for example, you now have a, you know, a, a, a craftsman in some African country, Nigeria for example, and they're making shoes or furniture or whatever. Well, they, they have you know, the ability to post that product anywhere in the world. They have websites which have the ability to um, allow them to receive orders. But what they didn't have until Bitcoin is a payment system. Pay PayPal won't go there because it's too risky for them because there's too, too much chance of fraud. Um, you know, other banking, major banking institutions will stay away. And plus there's huge fees involved in all of these things. Bitcoin allows these people to become online and competitive in a global way like never before. And that is going to raise the standard of living for the world's poorest people by ways that we can't even imagine. But it's going to be a dramatic effect. And you're going to see a huge lift of the very poorest people in the world in terms of the quality of their life as they are catapulted into a 21st century economic system. So this is actually a pretty contentious issue in the, in the industry. So certainly the, the great vision um, of Bitcoin is that we'll slash remittance fees, which again helps the very poorest people in our world. Um, but the challenge is the vast majority of our fees, we, we see we hear at Western Union and they take like eight or 9% of people's funds that they send overseas. And the assumption is that you know it's like a, it's a, a duopoly or it's only a handful of players, it's not a competitive market, and these fees are very, very high. And we think that maybe Bitcoin will eliminate that. But there is another issue. The fees are not necessarily high because of these greedy um, people. There's actually there's enough competition there that it does drive down prices as low as they can go. What's, what's very expensive is the compliance with anti-money anti laundering laws and uh, know your customer laws. <clears throat> and so if, if there's a Bitcoin remittance business, in order to stay on the right side of the law, they too will have these enormous expenses in terms of um, know your customer and anti-money anti -money laundering laws. So. The, the, the way in which Bitcoin will actually help remittance is not in a, in a one-step remittance, remittance businesses allowing Bitcoin. I don't think it's going to make that big a, a, an impact on the remittance industry. But what will make a tremendous impact is when Bitcoin is freely available, uh, you, you can spend it in lots of different places, you can earn it in lots of different places, and lots of people have Bitcoin in both sending and receiving countries. Now remittance costs go to zero. And that's very exciting for, again, the very poorest people in the world. Yes. So why inflation is such an interesting topic is that it's been said by many who understand it to be the most insidious of taxes the world has ever known. It's a tax that attacks the poorest people in the world and it attacks those people on fixed incomes. People who have diligently saved their whole lives and uh, enter into retirement and try and uh, live off their savings very quickly find that um, inflation erodes the value of their savings and the quality of their life goes down. And in the, some extreme examples, like here I'm holding a $100 trillion note from Zimbabwe, um, the, the poor citizens of that nation put their faith in their government to create a currency and via inflation all of the uh, currency wealth of the nation was stolen from its people and it's, it's left it a destitute nation. Now, the, the, the reason we come back to the concept of trust with Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is, cannot be inflated, we don't have to trust any particular government like a Zimbabwean government or our own government or any other government. Because of Bitcoin, inflation cannot happen. And that is incredibly valuable for the entire world, and especially the poorest people of us. Within the Bitcoin protocol, there are 21 million Bitcoins available. Now, each Bitcoin can be subdivided into one 100 millionth unit. So whatever that turns out to be, 21 trillion units or so there are, there, there can be available in Bitcoin. 
But that's different, although it has a large uh, user base or a large um, number of units, that's different from inflation. Inflation is when the, the, those units, the supply of those units increase. When Ben Bernanke at the Fred or Yellen now prints off um, US dollars, what he's doing is he's increasing the, the number of monetary units out in circulation. What that does is it makes the value of each one unit worth less. Therefore, we need to spend more to buy goods and services. We get rising prices. We've got inflation. So because the government prints the money, the value of the money we hold becomes less valuable, and that's what we call inflation. With Bitcoin, that, that 21 million Bitcoins cannot and ever be increased. And so the, that's cryptographically proven in the, in the blockchain. And because of that, Bitcoin will never see inflation. So since 1913, when the Federal Reserve took over the United States dollar, we've seen that the United States dollar has decreased in value 98%. I got, you need to think about this in terms of, we think of taxation as, you know, we, we see that, it's very real, and every month, you know, every year now, you know, 20, 30, 40% of our um, income is, we have to send off to the government. But what is not known is it's actually the, the lesser of two taxes. Inflation is a far higher tax because on your income you pay it just once. But with inflation, you pay it on your net worth every single year. Your net worth, your net worth held in currency. And so every single year, if the figures they tell us are true, which they're not, but let's take them as true for the moment. If you're paying a 2% tax on your net worth every single year, that 2% compounds very, very quickly. And over the course of your life, inflation is going to be the greatest tax that you pay, far more than income tax.